Okay, well, welcome to the hottest seminar. Um, we've all been here many times, I think, so I'll just give a couple of brief reminders. Um, so the talk is being recorded, and assuming Favoni agrees afterwards, we'll post the recording to YouTube. Um, everyone should keep their microphones muted unless they wanna ask a question. And when you ask a question, the procedure is just to unmute your microphone and interrupt the speaker and ask your question. Um, the talk will last roughly 60 minutes. That's the plan anyway. And uh, then we'll have up to 30 minutes after that for discussion. Okay, so today's speaker is Favonia from the University of Minnesota, but he's coming to us from Norway. And his title is Towards Efficient Cubicle Type Theory. Okay, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to the uh, hottest seminar. So today I would like to share with everyone some of the uh, interesting discoveries in the cubicle type theory that, are, that were not publicly presented yet as far as I'm, I know. So hopefully you will find something interesting from my talk today. So, um, so what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about efficiency that uh, all kinds of things about efficiency in the cubicle type theory. And the reason I'm going to talk about that is because I, we want to have a theoretical scientific study of the issues we encountered. Uh, but before that, let me just give everyone a very short introduction to the cubicle type theory. So, um, so here is a very uh, innocent looking judgments. So it says that um, M is of type A. So the first important idea of cubicle type theory is to introduce something called a formal interval. So for example, if you put a formal interval in a context, that means that now M and A are lines. So M is a line of a type A, which is also a line. And you can put more than one variable, uh, oh, sorry, more than one dimension variable in the context. So if you put two, then it will be a square. So you will be a square line over A. You can put more, so that will be a cubed line over the A cube. You can put four line, well, sorry, I didn't draw the connection, but you can imagine that this will be a four cube line over A. By the way, um, people have been complaining that our construction of the universe is in the cubicle type theory has been too complicated. So one way that I found very useful is that if you are able to train your mind to, to visualize these four dimensional objects, then maybe that actually helps you a lot. That will help you a lot in understanding the universes, but okay, well that's not the, I won't talk about them today. Um, so in general, if you have n variables in the context, that really leads to n dimensional cubes. And we are not very creative in making up names, so we just call them n cubes. So that's the first important ideas, so which is to put the formal intervals in the context. So you can talk about these n cubes directly. Uh, there's a second important idea, which is the count structure, or more, more um, precisely, the count feeling of count composition structure. Um, there are many ways to present this structure, and in today's talk, I'm going to present them in two separate operators. The first thing, it's called coercion or transport. So imagine that you, now you have a square type like A lying down there, and you have a line, the term M, lying over the zero end point of A. Um, so the coercion gives you the ability to coerce this line along A to the other end of the, um, uh, the, the square which is the one, and so you, the syntax will be like CoE, which is a same for coercion, from zero to one, and in the type A, then it's indexed by I, because I is the direction that you, you are doing the coercion. So you start with M, then you end up with something of type 
a equal to with one for i. So that's the type where at the uh, one end of a. So you can actually generalize this operator a little bit. Well, it actually depends on the variance of the cubical type theory you are talking about. But in some variants, um, not only you can do the coercion from zero to one, but you can also do the coercion from zero to j. Mm -hmm. So here, um, you start with zero, but instead of going all the way to the one end, you go to the diagonal. So the j going to the j direction, so diagonal is really lying over the diagonal that i equal to j, because that's the destination. So you end up with something of type a with a j for i. In general, you can, well, it really depends on the variance you're talking about, but in, in some variants of the cubical type theory, you can have arbitrary R to R prime, where R, R is a dimension expression. So that's the, um, the first operator. The second operator is what's called homogeneous composition. So again, imagine that you have a type M, so, sorry, a term M of type A as shown in the picture. And now you can put in like different faces around it. You can put a face um, on, the, on the zero end of M with, and on the other end, and then something in the back, which is denoted by the equation J equal to one. So the homogeneous composition gives you the cap of it. And the syntax is that, uh, well, it's H come, H stands for the homogeneous, and then you are going from zero to one, well, the direction is not really named, but you can see in the diagram, there's an arrow marked as H com. So that's the direction, direction you are doing the composition. And you are doing from zero to one, and you are walking inside of type A, so that's the A there. Uh, and then the cap is M, and there's a list of faces. So each face is, Mark it with the equation denoting the location that the face is uh, at. So the entire thing is homogeneous because you can see that when you are doing the composition or filling, you are not changing the type. It's still lying over the same A. So the type is still the same, and you end up with something of type A eventually. It's different from the coercion. Um, in some, again, in some variants of cubical type theory, you can have, you can a little bit of generalization. Uh, for example, you can, instead of going zero to one, you can go from zero to I. So this is like, instead of getting a cap on the top, you're getting a diagonal in the middle. Um, there's also another way to generalize, generalize this operation, which is that, um, instead of getting only, uh, instead of specifying only the zero end of something or one end of something, you can also specify the diagonal. So here you can put in like for example, a pair of faces and some diagonal in the middle, and you are asking like how um, about the cap like covering it. So or you can actually mix these two generalization together. Well, again, depending on the variance you are talking about. So this is the second um, um, operator of the con structure. So together with these two operators, um, we can have univalence and a higher indexed inductive types, not just higher inductive types, that's already the past. Uh, we can have all of this with canonicity. Um, I, want, I have to put a warning sign there because we have been changing the, the cubicle type theory um, again and again, and the current variants that are in use, that for example, in the proof of system, red TT and the cubicle TT, that particular version, um, we didn't, the canonicity proof is not finished yet but we strongly believe that it should be okay because none of the changes should break the canonicity. So the, the proof is not, technically speaking, the proof is not done, but we, we have very 
good reason to believe that the canonicity should hold. And there are lots of relevant results, um, so the CCHM, and that's rather like the thing there. So the slides will be available, right? Um, okay, so that's the case. And also to count latest notes, so that proved the homo homotopic canonicity, and that also shows that many details of the cubicle type theory um, don't actually matter in terms of the canonicity. But I'll, I'll leave it as it is. It's quite technical. So um, I'm also going, um, there's also one thing I want to bring up is that nowadays there are several um, proof assistant available or that you can use. But they are all on the GitHub and you can just download it and compile it and have fun. Um, so there are several things from the Carnegie Mellon universities, so Red Pro and Red TT. There are also several other assistants from the Sweden, like Agda and Kubico TT. Um, the Yak TT is like we take the we took the Kubico TT and then modified the underlying type theory so that it. It's closer to the type theory used in the Red Pro or Red TT. Um, so on the left hand side, so these three systems, um, so you have the a more general uh, composition direction, as I said before, you're allowing R to R prime, which is arbitrary direction. And you can also have the diagonal denoted by R equal to R prime. But in terms of the, the structure of the interval, you only have zero, one, or variable. On the other side, um, the composition operator is slightly more restricted. So you only have zero to one. And for the phases you can specify is always of the form r equal to zero or i equal to one. But the r itself has richer structures. So in addition to zero, one, you also have the n, o, or I mean, the two connections and also have the reversal. And in both cases, we figure out how to have the univalence, the univalent uh, universes, high inductive types, and so on. Um, you can read really just Google it and then find them on the GitHub and, and play with it. Um, so that's my very short introduction to the cubicle type theory. And I'm going to share with you about some of the interesting um, discoveries that we found like while developing, while doing research in the cubicle type theory. The first thing I'm going to talk about is extension types. So this is a generalization of paths. We will see what's going on. Um, so let's talk about paths. So what is a path type? So Imagine that you have a type A like um, parameterized by the dimension i, so it's like lying over the dimension i. So you also have a term of type A. And with the endpoint on the zero end being m, and on the one end being n. So the path step allows you to do the kind of the path, uh, sorry, dimension abstraction. You can bound, you can bind the dimension i inside of the term. And for example, if you bind a dimension i, and this will give you an element in the path type like written like this. So it's path, and you i dot a, it's a dependent path. And with endpoint n and n. So that's what you often, that's what we will see in uh, many papers about cubicle type theory. And my, my point is today is that you should throw away this and replace it with something more general. So what is something more general? With, so that is extension types. So for, for um, so that's first of all define um, just rewrite the paths in terms of extension types. So in terms of extension type, a path type is really just so you have a i, and now you have the freedom to specify the um, the boundary. So a path type has two boundaries. Right? So you specify the zero end, the one end. So it's written explicitly here. So uh, for example, here um, uh, it's an extension type with a one bound dimension i and with 
two specifications, and also one of them is specifying the zero end. So what happened well, if the i equals to zero, and the other part is to describe what will happen if i equals to one. Um, but if you have more freedom, for example, um, you don't have to specify all the endpoints, and that is very crucial and very uh, convenient, at least, if you want to prove or, some, or state something in the cubicle type theory. So for example, if you want to define concatenation operator, like showing the picture that if you have a path P and a path Q and you want to concatenate them, how would you write down the type of the concatenation? Well, if you look at the hot book, then you will find that, well, first of all, you have to say for any three points in the type A and any two paths then in the adjacent points, and then you have a path. Um, if you have the extension types, you can avoid mentioning the three points. So for that, as you can see in the slide, so the P is really just a line in the A. I don't care what kind of endpoint like the P has because it doesn't really matter. And then I want another path whose zero endpoint is the one endpoint of P. Again, I don't care about the one endpoint of Q. And then I will get a path which match up with the uh, zero endpoint of P and one endpoint of Q. So here I, I avoid my trouble in like writing down all the endpoints which are not necessary. And so, so this already like save us some trouble when writing on the types. Um, it, this can be, uh, um, this is actually more very general. For example, instead of having just one bound dimension, you can have two. Um, if you are working with only past types, then you actually have to specify all the four boundaries of the squares. But here I have the freedom to specify whatever I want. Um, like for example, here I'm, I'm saying that the bound variables are i and j, and I only specify the zero endpoint and the diagonal, and that's all. So things will getting like, the differences will be larger and larger if you go to the three dimension or, or further, because you want to specify the path of path of path, then you'll have to specify all the eight faces. Sorry, six faces, uh, if it's um, right. Sorry, um, the, the six faces of the cube, and that is really annoying if you, if you just don't care. And so the extension type gives you the freedom to specify it. Well, um, the things you you really have to specify. So this is so this is convenient and 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 today's talk is about efficiency. So this is not just convenient; it also has the impact on the count operations that you might want to define. Um, for example, if you didn't specify any endpoints, saying that you are just talking about um, the line in the A without the endpoint specification, when you are trying to do the coercion in the line type, then you actually can just do the coercion in the base type. The reason is that you didn't specify any endpoint, so there's no endpoint, there's no endpoint to fix. If you look at the count operation of the past type, then you'll realize there are some extra composition, blah, 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 and they are there in order to, to make sure that the endpoints are still reasonable or coherent. Uh, we will see the, some similar things like in, the, in the end of the talk, but I want to point out that um, extension types are very useful, uh, not just to reduce your work in, in terms of stating or proving theorems, but also it simplifies the count operation, and that will lead to shorter term and hopefully more efficient type theory. So this is the first thing I want to talk about. And the second thing I want to talk about is a story of empty systems. So what is an empty system? Well, imagine that you have an M, a line M, or line over the type A, and you are, again want to do the composition. But this time, you didn't specify any phase at all. It's just empty, then you are going from 
one end to the other end without any constraints. So that's the empty system. Um, this looks bad because you might wonder why can't I just reduce this to M since there's no constraint at all. Um, this turns out to be very difficult if you don't have regularity. And we don't really know how to do regularity with um, univalent, uh, with a univalent con universe and high inductive types and all other features. Without them, it's, it's easy to achieve them, but with all of the additional features we want, we don't know how to reach the regularity. Uh, there's a very nice summary done by the Andrew Swan uh, in, the, in the archive paper. Um, I actually recommend everyone to read it. It's a very nice summary about what's currently known and what's currently unknown. Sorry, what's uh, regularity? Uh, regularity is that if you are doing the composition where all the faces are raffle, the, uh, the constant path, then you should get the same thing in the end. For example, here you should get an M instead of having an unreduced composition line there. Did I answer your question? Yep, okay. thanks. Oh, okay. Um, so, so in general, we don't know how to get rid of it, but maybe in some cases we can get rid of it, but I'll, I'll talk about it later. Um, but before getting rid of them, that's Think about them, like why do we have these empty systems from the very beginning? Well, there are two major reasons why they are there. The first thing is the lack of the coercion um, in some variants of the cubicle type theory. The second problem is the for all operator used in the construction of the universes. Um, so let me talk about the first thing first. Um, in some variants of the cubicle type theory, instead of having two separate operators, I talk about a coercion and homogeneous composition, there's only one composition operator, which is just called composition. Uh, the difference is, is that now um, the type can depend on the feeling direction as shown in the picture. So this is a U shape, and you want to do the composition, but now the A, the type, the underlying type can depend on the fielding direction. So that's the dependent one. Um, in some variants, there's no separation. Of, um, wait, I lost, I lost my screen. This is weird. Sorry. Oh. Okay, sorry, I'm back. So, wait. Um, Dan, are you there? Yes. Okay, because I, I couldn't see the Zoom window now, so, okay. So everyone can still see me, I will see. Yeah. All right, so let me just continue. Um, so in some variants of a cubicle type theory, you don't have the, the coercion or a homogeneous composition. You only have one single count. And, but you still have to do the coercion in the proof. So the only thing you can do is to have the composition without um, any faces, which is an empty system. So that's one major source of the uh, the empty system, at least in the past. Um, the solution is simple. Well, you just have this separation and you'll be fine. The separation of the coercion and homogeneous composition turns out to be important for uh, the high inductive type to work. And as a side effect, it also kills a major source of empty systems. So, so it's, it's a very good thing to do. Um, but, but, but you only kill the ma one major source, there's still empty system lying around because of the universes, the for all operator I just talked about before. Um, so the question will be, is it possible to kill empty systems completely? Uh, so what I mean is that to restrict the shapes of the homogeneous composition to the co-vibration which are 
Um, so I provided three ways to talk about them. It depend on your taste, you should be able to find something that um, that you like. In terms of geometry of just the visualization, it means that all the faces you you put enough faces to cover all the vertices or all the points. In terms of syntax, it means that under any close substitution of the dimensions, you, it's always true. Some of the uh, equation, for example, should, should be triggered. In terms of a topos theory, then, um, so you take the co-vibration for the co-vibration objects, and you take all the co-vibrations whose uh, interpretation into the omega, had, um, and then you take a double negation of it, it's true. So, I, um, so um, for people who are, um, let me think. So for the experts, um, in reality, the co-vibration might not be a sub-object of the subject classifier. So it may be, there might be some duplication in the co-vibration object. So that's why I need to write down the interpretation function, which sends the co-vibration into this, um, the omega. But anyway, so these three are equivalent. But I'm a geometry person. I couldn't do math without visualization. So let me just show you some pictures. Um, so what I mean is that if you only put one face, for example, and the, the two corners are missing, so this is not okay. On the other hand, if you put a pair, or you, if you just put enough faces to cover all the endpoints, they, they don't need to be a pair, um, and it, then it's fine. So we are considering the, the, the middle one and the right one, but not the left one. So in, in many variants of the cubical type theories, based on Cartesian cubes, we know how to do it. We are able to restrict ourselves to this, uh, just a subset of the co-vibration and it's okay. Um, for the one based on the De Morgan cubes, for example, the, the CCHM system, well, ask Andrea. So Andrea has a very brilliant idea about uh, like that might work. I don't think it's completely verified yet, but it's kind of promising. So the difficulty is that um, for pi sigma um, paths, they, they are all fine, but the universe are tricky um, because of the for all operator, which, which might remove some bases from the co-vibration. Um, you might no longer end up with a co-vibration that is still within a subset you are considering. So you still need to somehow find a way to do the composition with respect to those um, co-vibration outside the subset. So in some variants, we managed to define a new composition operator based on the limited version so that you can handle all the co-vibration. But in general, I don't know whether this can be done. So the open question will be like how general the solutions are and the second thing is that whether the extra complexity in order to handle the arbitrary collaboration worth it. Um, so these are unknown. Um, so this is the second thing I want to talk about. And the third thing I want to talk about is kinds. So this is really a detour, but eventually I'm going to use kinds in order to optimize the cubicle type theory. So bear with me with this little detour. Um, so what are kinds? By kinds, I'm talking about like different kinds of universes. Um, so Vladimir has proposed the homo, um, homotopy type system, which has the count types and the fibrin types and also the pre-types. Um, and also there are lots of works on the two level type theory that which also have the same um, count types and free types. So one, the first thing I want to talk about is that, well, in addition to these two, I think it's very useful to have a third kind, which is the discrete types. So in terms of modeling, it's in a pre-shift model, this, they are just constant pre-shifts. Uh, so what's the benefits of having these 
discrete types. Well, the important thing is that the entire ETT, the extensional type theory, so I don't really like the name, but uh, whatever people call, them, call it as extensional type theory, you can embed the entire thing, including the equality types, into this universe. And they will co peacefully coexist with all other features like univariance and so on. So you can have the equality types and the past types all together and it's all fine. So that's why I feel it's very useful to just have it. Um, in general, you can have many more kinds like you have, have like the types with only the homogeneous composition, but maybe not a coercion, or maybe the other way around have the coercion, but not a homogeneous composition. Or, or, and you can also talk about how whether some of them is degenerate or not. Um, and you can put in more, but I, I don't want to go into that direction in this talk. Instead, I'm going to talk about a general framework to deal with this kind of um, fancy kind of structure. Um, so kind, one, by, by that I mean that the automatic association of the structure or the, some additional properties with types or a family of types. So this is different from the, um, the talk we saw two weeks ago, which you explicitly passed, the, for example, the proof that sometimes is a vibrant uh, along. Like, so in this framework, the, the system will automatically associate, for example, your, the particular implementation of the count operation and so on to the types. Um, this turned out to be at least working. I think it's very useful. Um, so, so the thing I want to talk about is that what would be the minimum structure if you want to write your own proof of system with fancy uh, kind of structures. The minimum structure I claim is the meet semi-lattice. And it will be better if there's a heighting semi-lattice. So let me show you why. There are two important questions you often have to answer when you are doing the type checking and also um, the, the design of the proof of systems. The first thing is that if somehow you already know A type has a kind K1, K2 to the Kn, does that mean that A has a type K star? So if you already have the same analysis available, it's as easy as to just to compute the meet of the K I and then to see whether it's less than or equal to K star. So, um, so that answers the, the, the need of the uh, type checking. The second question is will be like, what's missing from, if, if you already know that A has a kind K, but somehow during the proof checking or type checking, you realize that you also need to acknowledge, also need the knowledge that A has a kind K star. So you, you might wonder like what's missing from K to K star. So this is very useful if you want to generate useful error message to the user. Because you might know, for example, uh, from the context, A has a composition structure, sorry, homogeneous composition structure, but it, but it may or may not have the coercion. And in the proof, you need something of, uh, with both. So you can then, with this operator, calculate the kind coercion out of it, and then say that, well, please provide the coercion structure. So these two, I claim that just the essential parts, and you can, we actually build the entire proof of system out of the, just the same letters with a decidable pre-order and with this um, heighting operation, the, the, the arrow. So that's the general framework of kinds. Now I'm going to back to the discussion of the efficiency, which is to combine the kinds and high inductive types. So I will just focus on very particular high inductive type, which is, should be familiar to everyone, which is the push out. So suppose that you have the, uh, the span. Um, so the span is just that apex is C, and you have two functions f and g sending the elements in C to A and B uh, respectively. And you want to form the push out of this span. 
So in terms of the code, by the way, this is almost the actual code in the Red PT. You can just copy and paste it. Um, um, so you have the constructor in L, so that will give you the um, a way to inject the elements from A to the push out. And similarly for the in R for the, the other side, then you have the push, which is really the, uh, the weakness of the commutativity of this square. So you take I, you take a C, and on the zero endpoint, you should be the in left of F of C. And on the, on the one endpoint, you should be in right of G of C. So that's just the, the definition of push out of, of more precisely the homotopy push out. Um, so we want to implement the count up because this is count. This is a count type. And so we want to implement, well, we want to implement the count operation of it. Also, so you might wonder how should we implement the coercion? For in left and in right, it's quite easy. So coercion of in left of A is just in left of coercion of A. And similarly, coercion of in right of B is just in right of coercion of B. You can just swap the coercion and the constructor. It will be fine. However, for the coercion of the, the third constructor, push, these things got very tricky. And you cannot just swap the coercion and push the coercion inside. The reason is that it doesn't have the correct boundary. So, so it can be sh like shown in these pictures, uh, which have lots of ingredients. But let me just start from the top left. So on the top left, you have the push IC. That's, so that's the starting point. So the dashed red arrow is the coercion. So suppose that you are working with the wrong definition or wrong implementation. You are implementing the coercion as the push of the coercion C. You just push the coercion inside of the constructor. Um, and then let's look at the zero endpoint of them. Before the coercion, the zero endpoint of it will be the in right, sorry, in left of F of C. After the coercion, the zero endpoint of it will be in left of F of coercion of C. However, if you do the coercion to the zero endpoint, then you'll end up with in left of coercion of F of C. The order is important. So here the difference is, is that one of them is F of coercion and the other thing is coercion of F. And in general, F, an uh, arbitrary function f does not commute with the coercion. So this, so the boundary, they just don't match up. So you couldn't do this. So um, in order to finish the coercion, you actually have to do some uh, more complicated composition in order to fix all the boundary to make sure that they will be coherent with the in left and in right endpoints. So this is really a shame because um, it would be so nice if we can just swap the coercion with the constructor. And actually, in some special cases, you can do it. Um, so one special case will be like, for example, if uh, the span, the, the function, the span, the f and g are clean. Um, it's hard for me to describe the definition of the clean. You should ask. So, yeah, right. Ask Evan Garfalo if you want to understand more about the cleanliness. Um, but one example will be the joints, because in the um, in the in the um, non-dependent pair type, it's just a times b. The the first and second projection of the non-dependent pair types are clean in the sense that the co coercion commutes with this function. So the cleanliness is really one, one way to understand cleanliness is that it captures some condition to make sure that the coercion will commute with them. So that's one case. In that case, you can just swap the coercion and push. The other case will be like if the endpoints of the, the co domain of F and G and A and B are just discrete. So in that case, you don't have anything to fix because they're just exactly the same point. 
that even though you swap the order of effect or coercion, that doesn't really matter. So, um, so I hope this shows a little bit that gives you some taste of what kinds of optimization we are looking after. Um, it's really important to have this optimization, otherwise you'll end up with lots of unnecessary edge count, even in those spatial cases, very common spatial cases actually, for example, joints and suspensions. So we have been studying very hard, like try to figure out like in what the sufficient conditions of all kinds of optimizations like this. So um, this is the final thing I want to talk about. So what's next? What's more? So we should we are we should uh, we are planning to uh, make great proof assistance. So assist, the word assistant here is very important because we want the proof assistant to really assist people. It shouldn't be just a proof checker. Uh, that means some, maybe some nice UI and other things. Uh, the second thing is that um, uh, the current operation of the universe are still relatively complicated. We have made great progress in uh, simplifying them, but I think it's still relatively complicated. So one, one thing can, one can do is to optimize them further. Um, the third thing is that, well, the regularity in general seems very hard. Uh, maybe we can recover some of them in some special cases. For example, um, if you have the, the kind structure, and maybe you know that for certain types, so the, this, the coercion can just be identity function. So it's actually the case, for example, for S1, the circle type, the coercion is just identity function. And there are, um, for example, the, the function, any, uh, function type of S1 to S1, so the coercion in that function type should also be just identity function. So that you can do lots of optimization like that. Um, finally, uh, we should try to finish all the meta theorems. Um, we have done a lot, but for things we are adding all kinds of new features and changing the type theories all the time, it might be good eventually uh, once we sit on some particular variance that, and to prove that uh, it has all the nice properties we want. Um, so thanks for your attention. This will be the end of my talk. Uh, Dan? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Favonia. So first, I'll unmute everyone so we can all applaud. Okay, and uh, now I'll open the floor to questions. We've got lots of time for questions, so please go ahead. Okay, I'll start with the question to get the ball rolling. Um, so I just want to understand better what you mean by um, adding in these optimizations. So are you adding in additional definitional equalities that are already implied by existing definitional equalities and just realizing that sooner than if you trace through the existing definitional equalities or is it something different? Um, we are changing, no, it's, it's not, um... It's not that we are just taking shortcuts of the existing definitional equality. You are, we are actually changing the theory of definitional equality. Okay. Um, mm. So you're trying to change to a theory that still, you know, has has a similar interpretation, but is a, is more adapted to being efficient in a proof of system. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, for, I can give an example. For example, if you have a, a, a dependent sigma type, so the coercion in the dependent sigma type for the second part, the second component, you need to do some uh, a little bit tricky fixing there. Um, so one optimization you can do for non-dependent thing will just to, if you recognize that it's non-dependent, then the second part is much simpler. 
So this is actually not the same. If you plug in a non uh, a constant family to the to the dependent sigma types, you will end up with different terms in general. Somebody else? Uh, so, Favonia, you, you mentioned you wanted to make great proof assistance. Um, so, does that mean you want to have, like, uh, what's it called? Like a Cox style tactics um, for your kind of next next iteration of the cubicle cubicle type type theories or or, or what uh, tactic is is one of the goal and in fact it's not just I want them I think we already have a very elementary uh, meta language but well, it's not as rich as the link yet but we already you can like in the middle of the proof, then you are going to the meta level and construct something and then put it back. So that is that can already be done in the red TT. So we already implemented some of them. And, and so what else do you hope to have in a great proof system? Uh, right now, I think we can certainly improve the error messages and we should have it's still in discussion, but we, we should have a way to, for example, avoid retype checking things every time. If you're if you're working on, for example, if you import a, a very complicated file proving the univalence, um, I don't want to re recheck it like every time I want to check the my current development. So that part is not done yet, and um, maybe some beta UI, which will help you to figure out what's going on when you are developing the proof. There are already some support. I'm not saying that we didn't implement anything, but I think many of them can be further improved. Does that, does that answer your question? Yep, that's good. Uh, can I ask a naive question? I'm, oh, sorry. Uh, Dan, to interrupt, uh, can I ask a naive question about the um, homogeneous composition operation? Mm -hmm. So okay. the, the picture I had in my head, I think, was the wrong picture. Um, uh, yeah, so, I'm going back. Right. So uh, maybe just exp <laughs> so I, I guess I would have I thought uh, that an instance of homogeneous composition would be um, we have a uh, a type A in the square, in the context of a square, and mm -hmm. we have terms in the context of a line over three of the boundary edges of the square, and we're getting a term over the fourth boundary edge of the square. But I don't, this picture doesn't seem to reflect that, so uh, please correct me. Oh, okay, so the, the thing you're talking about is the composite, uh, the depend, the, the non-homogeneous one, which is, actually I have a picture of that. Uh, this one. Yes, that was the picture that was in my head for homogeneous composition, but. Uh... Right, so, so by homogeneous, the homogeneous part is really about A not depending on the fielding direction. Right, so what you talk about is the non-homogeneous one. Okay, so I, I clearly just have no idea what the homogeneous composition is. Could you, so could you start over and explain that again, maybe in a low dimensional example? Okay, so uh, well, this is the homogeneous composition. So the idea is that A is not changing when you are do, in the fielding direction. Um, so you can already see that in the syntax, let me go back to this slides, what is that? Okay, you can already see that in the syntax, there's no mentioning of the fielding direction in the syntax A at all. A does not depend on the direction you are doing the fielding or composition. So A is uniform like across the entire thing. So the M and the resulting square in red all have exactly the same type, which is A. Mm -hmm. does, does that make sense? Okay, so it's it's like we're filling a part. I mean, you know, my intuition is obviously in the like the horn or the cubicle horn filling. It's it's like we're it's like A is uh, 
a, a cube that's constant in one dimension or something, which is, is right, 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 right. It's constant in the fielding direction. Right. Okay. Right. So, right. And, and the other way to think about it is that if you think about this as a solution to a lifting problem, then you're really doing some fiber wise construction. Mm -hmm. And what, so what, had, right. What had confused me about your pictures, it looks like you're uh, sort of, again, filling across cubes where you don't have all of the boundary pieces specified. But I guess the point is there's some sort of degeneracy and uncertain boundary components that you could, uh, I mean, use to sort of supply the missing initial data, something like that. Oh, I see what I'm talking about. So we have the flexibility. So it doesn't, it's different from the homes in this, uh, the simplicial case, if that's what you're talking about. So we can have some kind of, we can space of much less. Uh, you can just have a, maybe just an I equals zero, not even with a back space. So you can have lots of uh, uh, missing parts and that's fine. You can just, even just one face. Uh, great, thanks, that, that clears up some things. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, I have one. So how exactly, so I guess the deal with the, the kinds uh, semi-lattice is that uh, the, the, reason, the reason it can, it will um, make the, the, new, the new proof assistance more, more efficient is that if you have a, um, uh, if you have a type that lives in one of these more restricted kinds, then you can kind of uh, you can do computations with it much faster. Is is that the that's the general idea? Right. Um, the in terms of the cubical type theory, it, it's that you can avoid lots of boundary fixings. So, for example, if you want to do one of Guillaume's um, computations, like this Guillaume, uh, the Brunnery constant, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think Do you think that that will um, particularly that will help a lot in 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 this kind of calculation? Uh, we actually already kind of using it. So one special case is a suspension. Um, so if you want to define suspension in terms of push out, I'm, I'm not sure if you want to define, but one reason, uh, let me go back to the slide a little bit. The constructors still have the endpoint and the, the reason that you don't have to kind of fix the endpoint, one, one way to, to uh, prove that it's okay is because the endpoint is kind of unit type. And the, the unit type, there's only one element, and so this, you don't have to fix anything. Does, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so for example, you, you, you don't need these, these uh, extra H comms and stuff because, for example, co coercions will commute with whatever, the relevant, relevant functions. Right, right, so which will be very convenient. Okay, okay, cool. So I was going to ask, this was a follow-up to the question before about better proof assistance. What you were describing in your answer to that was sort of generally good things for proof assistance, but is there things you can think of that are more specific to a cubicle type theory that would make it more pleasant to use than book hot for certain things? Uh, compared to hot, we don't know, I don't know at least. Um, because I feel we are still experimenting lots of uh, uh, features. So compared to other more mature proof of system, I, I don't know. But there are some something that you, I think you will need if you want to do a development in the cubicle type theory. The one thing that is very helpful is that when in the middle of writing a term, so usually in the in the usual design of the type theory of proof assistant, you want to show the type of the whole, like the, the part that is still missing there. In the cubicle type theory, it's also important to show the boundaries. So you might want to understand that you are now working in this hole and you want to fill in something and there are some additional requirements from the environment. Maybe there's some additional requirements saying that Oh, by the way, the zero endpoint needs to be something, and also the diagonal needs to be something. So 
Um, I think that is not there in the traditional design of culture systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems useful to me if there were technology to draw the pictures. Like, like oh. can, you go from, can you go from boundary data in the type theory to a cube and like, you know, pop a cube up on the screen? Like a lot of the time that's what I do on pit by hand, but it's pretty laborious. Oh, that would be cool because then I don't have to spend one day to make these slides. Right. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well, I guess uh, we can all thank Favoni again. Okay. Uh, so that's it for this week. And we'll be back in two weeks. Our speaker in two weeks is Nikolai Krauss. And I hope to see you all then.